down by Young. Sorry, Yama Young. Yama Young. Still a down by Young. Got all of it. But that has got to be Caracal, hasn't it? It just, it just took my breath away and then I skipped. 36, 38. That's not a blue plaque, that's an alarm. Beach security, 41. Shangri-La, a word people know but can't define. It's an earthly paradise, a hotel chain, a Chinese city. 41 in the street ends. A Tibetan utopia. If this is still Oak Hill Gardens, this is okay, otherwise it's been knocked down. The word first appears in the 1934 fictional book, Lost Horizon, written by James Hilton. James Hilton. There you go, look. James Hilton, 1900 to 1954, novelist and scriptwriter, lived here. And there's a skeleton in the front window and an exercise bike. Lost Horizon was a sensation in its day, a bestseller that became the first book to be mass produced in paperback. Soon after, the story made it onto the silver screen with Frank Capra directing and Hollywood's most bankable actor, Ronald Coleman, in the lead role. Amidst tensions of world war, Lost Horizon's appeal was its idea of sanctuary. A utopian valley free from conflict where war, disease and even ageing were virtually unknown. In the story, star English diplomat Robert Conway and three others are kidnapped in a hijacked aeroplane which crash lands among snowy mountaintops somewhere in the Tibetan region. But James Hilton never actually went to Tibet. All of the ideas of Shangri-La were conceived on paper in one of the rooms in this house in, in Woodford in London. Soon after the book became a sensation, would-be Shangri-La seekers started their quest to find the mythical valley. Even Adolf Hitler sent a crack Nazi unit in 1938 to go look. Explorers, authors and filmmakers in the years that followed all made claim to finding it here, here, here. My name is Simon Chapman. I too write fictional stories about places I've never been. And I'm going on a journey to try and figure out if any of the geographical descriptions in the book Lost Horizon are based on an actual place. I start right here. Some people say that uh, James Hilton was an escapist, but that's, that's something he never denied. In an article written in the New York Times shortly after the filming of Lost Horizon, he talks about the European situation, because you've got to remember this is between the two world wars. But his idea of the geography of Shangri-La was spot on. He did much of the research in the British Museum, uh, which is where we are now. And in particular, he, he refers to one book that he used, which is The uh, Travels in Tartary, Tibet and China by Abbey Hook. Abbey Hook was a French priest who spent three years between 1844 and 1846 travelling an anti-clockwise circuit from Peking that took him in Inner Mongolia, Tibet and Sichuan. Along the way he wrote a detailed diary of his adventures. While the book explains some of the ideological themes in Lost Horizon, it does not explain all the detailed geographical descriptions. Could these have come from a more recent source? In the book the plane's path takes it from Kabul past K2 in the Karakoram range to a crash landing around here in the Kunlungs. But once it hits the ground, Conway and his three companions emerge into a place that seems to be somewhere else entirely. Most experts now agree. The Muli Monastery. Muli, Yading, where are they? I set off to China to find out. If you ask Chinese people where is Shangri-La, they won't point to the Kunlung Mountains, but more likely to northern Yunnan, 2,000 kilometers away. And that's because of Joseph Rock, who was a plant explorer who was based here in this actual set of buildings in the 1920s and 1930s. Rock was a botanist, explorer and accomplished photographer working for the US Department of Agriculture. From his base in Lijiang, he ventured out on expeditions into northern Yunnan and Sichuan, publishing stories of his travels in National Geographic magazine. Experts contend it is these articles that James Hilton had borrowed from to describe the geography of Shangri-La. Rock's 
。那通过，特别是通过这个呃国家地理发表的文章，就大家就知道了，在中国西南有这么一片很神秘的这么一片区域。I'm going to follow one of the expeditions to see for myself. I'm meeting with Jack Yao, a Chinese journalist who is going to help me with my quest. Okay, Sam,、um, uh, we're going to take a day、uh, on the car to go to Muli, then another day to go to the starting point of our trek, which we're going to do eight days in the mountain. Whereas Joseph Rock took about ten days just by horse and by walking just to get to the start point, didn't he? Yeah,、we? in no time. So.、Uh, What about the the bandits he had to contend with? Gonna, are we going to face any of those? Don't worry about them. It's a tourist group. You worry more. Before we start our journey, Jack wants to meet a man who can help explain the link between Joseph Rock and Shangri-La.、Yeah. This is 91-year-old Zhuang Ke, son of Joseph Rock's secretary. He is like this. He has never opened this place. He has never opened it. But we are not the only ones. 牡蛎的岛下面一点。Zhuang Ke organized the translation of Lost Horizon into Chinese in the late 1970s, and soon after, the name Shangri-La entered into the Chinese imagination. Cities in the area competed to change their name. This one, I, as I know, is two. The current one is the Zhuang Ke Line, 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 日瓦乡就改名为香格里拉乡，呃，中电线是二零零一年改名的，那个日瓦乡呢是二零零二年改名的。那简单来讲，改名的背后主要是旅游经济、发展旅游经济的需要。Rock did not write about Chongdian until after Lost Horizon was published, making the Rio, the gateway to Yading and Muli, to have the only credible claim. Although Zhuang Ke was the first to see the link between Lost Horizon and the travels of Joseph Rock, it was an American lawyer and amateur mountaineer, Ted Vale, who first narrowed the focus to one specific area. He sourced、uh, Shangri-La mainly on the Muli Monastery, as depicted by Joseph Rock in a series of articles in the late 1920s and early 1930s about that area. Of the numerous articles that Joseph Rock wrote about this region, it's the 1931 article that Ted Vale picks up on as having the most similarities to Lost Horizon.、Uh, we're doing part of the trip now, which is to drive from Lijiang to Muli, and then from Muli, Joseph Rock went up the valley and round a tour of Jambayan. The similarities we're looking for with Lost Horizon are the valley itself and its similarities to Shangri-La, the Muli Monastery, and then the peak of Jambayan itself. We start at the Muli Monastery. It's amazing how it's opened up. It's beautiful, isn't it? This is the new Muli Monastery, isn't it? Yeah. I was told the old one is here. They they covered. It's covered somewhere, isn't yeah, it? It should be this one, I think. So, from what I can see, the sim- Shangri-La similarities that we've got incredibly closed-in valley, which is all but inaccessible. There's meant to be gold down there somewhere. Lots of golden mines here. The gold mines. And the, and the king of Muli wouldn't let anyone out. Joseph Rock first went to the kingdom of Muli as it was then in 1924. He struck up a friendship with the king, securing for himself a base for subsequent expeditions. In 1928, he persuaded the Muli king to introduce him to Drashet Songpen, chief of the outlaws of Konkaling. The chief had declared Konkaling off limits for normal travel, and that incomers would be killed. But with the Muli king's influence, Drashet Songpen agreed to leave Rock's expedition unharmed, and this opened up a new mountain range for him to explore. The Muli monastery was the centre of the old kingdom of Muli, and the place Vale believes is the inspiration for the Shangri-La lamasery. Hilton describes the scene as Conway first comes across it. An austere emotion carried the eye upwards from milk blue roofs to the grey rock bastion above. Rock describes blue tile roofs in Muli and the grey crags of Mitsuga behind the monastery, but other descriptions of the place were far from a utopian community. There was tension here. The king was somewhat of a despot. He wasn't the father Perrault of, of Lost Horizon. There was the ever-present danger of bandits who didn't raid the valley, but they were certainly round the edges. The king would execute prisoners. This certainly was not the the idyll of peace and tranquility of James Hilton's Lost Horizon. The blue tiles have since gone, and the crags behind are covered in cloud. We push on. 
As the road gets narrower and the valley steeper, we pass watchtowers erected to protect gold mines that used to line the valley. Almost a six hour drive from the monastery, the landscape starts to feel closer to the valley of Shangri-La as described in Lost Horizon, but there's still a lack of high mountains and rather a lot of electric pylons. We finally reach Dulu village and stay overnight in one of the homes depicted in the 1931 article. Early the next day we start a hike into the Hengduan mountains. Here we hire a team of four horses to carry our expedition gear, a muleteer and his 21 year old niece, Gasan, a tourism student in Chengdu, who will be our guide. Over the next eight days we plan to climb up the valley and over several passes up to 4,800 metres to loop around the snow mountains following the same route that Joseph Rock describes in his 1931 article. On the trek we'll be looking for similarities between Rock's descriptions in the article and the geographical clues mentioned in Lost Horizon. Ted Vale has claimed 22 points of similarity. We are here to check the facts on the ground. People here still remember Joseph Rock. Zuenke, who was old enough to vaguely remember the explorer, and it turns out that Sulong, our muleteer, also knows of him through his grandfather's stories. We show Su Long the clothing worn in the film version of Lost Horizon, and he confirms it is the same his grandfather wore. This is different from the clothing worn by people in the Kunlungs at the time. After climbing for two days, we get our first glimpse of one of three holy peaks, Zanadurji, or Chanadurji as Rock called it. We have one final push to get over the 4,700 meter Zabala Pass and in amongst the mountains. Um, I noticed in the, in the book, Lost Horizon, uh, James Hilton wrote, he twisted quite a few uh, names in, in different places. Why, why would he do that? Well, I write fiction books, and when I'm writing about faraway places, I change the names deliberately. And the reason is because you want to get a sense of the area. But if you have the exact place, this is fiction, remember, people will look at it and say, well, why is that place ne next to the other place? Well, really, they're thousands of miles apart. At our next camp, we woke up to our first view of Yamayong or Jambaya, as Rock calls it. This is the pyramid mountain that Vale believes to be identical to Karakal, the snow mountain of Shangri-La. But we're on the wrong side and we'll have to wait a few days to reach the other side of the mountain to get a view of the snow cone that Rock describes. Soon after, the clouds roll in and we're left in mist and rain to traverse higher passes and cross boulder fields on the slopes of the holy mountain. With the weather closing our activity down, I use the spare time to focus on the similarities between Joseph Rock's 1931 article and the book Lost Horizon. This area is certainly inaccessible and it would be in snow time. Just over there, there's the pyramid mountain of, of Jambayang, which is very much like the Karakal in, in the book. There are gold deposits in the Muli Valley, just like the gold deposits within Shangri-La. In the film, for which James Hilton was a consultant on, the clothing worn by the Tibetans when they rescue the party after the air crash, is very much the clothing from this area. There's also the fact that once you're in Shangri-La, you can't leave. The same way that the King of Muli forbade his subjects to leave the Muli Valley. But there are also geographical inconsistencies. In Lost Horizon, the plane crashes in the Kunlung range, and this is where a friend of Conway's called Rutherford goes searching for him at the end of the book. But when Conway comes out, he arrives in Kanding, just north of Muli, and then enters back through northern Thailand, again much closer to Muli than the Kunlungs. In the epilogue, Rutherford comes across an explorer from the American Geographical Society who's exploring in the region. Is this a hidden acknowledgement of Joseph Rock? At this point, like Vale, we are slowly ticking off geographical descriptions from Rock's 1931 article against similar descriptions in Lost Horizon. But there are a few niggling inconsistencies that are stopping me from declaring that I've found Shangri-La. So Simon, you, st you still think this is Shangri-La? 
Well, there's a lot of points to say it is, but I've still got a couple of misgivings. One of the things is when James Hilton actually specifically talks about his sources, he talks about the, the missionaries that, that went up into the Himalayas in the 16th and 17th century, but in no way does he mention Joseph Rock. I mean, we've said that he's been to the British Library and Joseph Rock's articles were there and that sort of thing, but there is no mention of any of the modern day exploration. We take one day to stop the march, take our day packs and go discover the Yadding Park just over the final pass. Here we start to run into floods of tourists who pay $50 to be bussed into the valley and make the climb up to the one point in the range where on a clear day you can view all three holy mountains. In the valley below at the Tsengu Gombe Monastery, where Rock took refuge from heavy rain, Jack pulls me aside to address the elephant of the room. An ancient Buddhist mythical kingdom that has a striking resemblance to Shangri-La, its name, Shambhala. So basically it's a, it's a kingdom uh, north of India, I think across the Himalaya mountains. So the, the kingdom is surrounded by snow mountains, it's, it's not accessible for people from outside and also the people from inside cannot get out. And basically people living there live a long life and there's no hunger, no poverty. Furthermore, it's a place collecting all the knowledge. When the people in the world destroy themselves, you know, with war, with all the bad stuff, and they will appear again, like a new world, to pass on the knowledge. So I, I wonder if this is a heavily impact to, to James Hilton's yeah, novel. I think, I mean, Father Perot in uh, Lost Horizon says that uh, this is a repository of knowledge, and when the people outside have wars, it'll you know, they'll be used. So I can't help thinking that James Hilton has been heavily influenced by, by reading about Shambhala and then, uh, then using that in a more limited sense in his book. The other thing is, let's face it, the name, Shambhala, Shangri-La. <laughs> it's, it's quite very, similar. Very similar, yeah. As the light was falling, we hiked back over the pass to the solitude of our campsite beyond the reaches of Yadding Park. As the others sleep, I take the opportunity for one last read through all the media interviews where Hilton discusses Shangri-La. I'd missed something. Jack, Jack, are you, are you in there? I found something that I think is really important, and I think it explains why James Hilton never acknowledged that he uh, took any inspiration from Joseph Rock. And I think it's to do with libel laws. Right? Um, this is from a 1936 newspaper, and I somehow overlooked this before. This is to quote, somehow the libel law crept into the conversation. Mr. Hilton told how English authors now had to be careful even about some of the places he described, as someone had been successfully sued a novelist after recognising the description of the cottage the plaintiff owned. Copyright, he said. Yeah, so he, would, he could be worried that if he mentioned Joseph Rock, uh, Joseph Rock was acting as an explorer at the same time in the National, you know, under the National Geographic, and it could be used. It wouldn't be a problem without using Abbey Hook, and he does mention Abbey Hook, because Abbey Hook had done his stuff in 1846, 1847. That's 100 years ago, almost. Yeah, so, so there's no worry about that. We continue our journey across a 4,800 metre high pass, and round to the south of Yamayong to see for ourselves the view Rock describes in his article, and Bale claims Hilton copied. This is what Joseph Rock wrote. In a cloudless sky before me rose the peerless pyramid of Jambayang, the finest mountain my eyes ever beheld. The sky was greenish black, the snowy pyramid was grey, but the apexes of both it and Shenrezig suddenly turned a golden yellow as the sunrise kissed them. James Hilton wrote this. There soaring into the gap and magnificent in the full shimmer of moonlight appeared what he took to be the loveliest mountain on earth. It was almost a perfect cone of snow, simple in outline as if a child had drawn it. It was so radiant, so serenely poised, that he wondered for a moment if it were real at all. To get off the mountain and back to civilization, we make a final walk towards the newly named town of Shangri-La. A beautiful fertile valley, ringed by impenetrable mountains, where the Lamarish is sitting beneath a pyramid-shaped mountain, just like the descriptions of Shangri-La and Lost Horizon. Joseph Rock was here, he writes. The monastery was the rendezvous of all the outlaws and bandits and perhaps some occasional genuine pilgrim of the surrounding no man's land. It's a far cry from the harmonious community of Shangri-La, but the geographical features are all here. Jack has one more question. So Simon, we are, we are at the end of our journey. Do you think this is the real Shangri-La? 
Partially, yes. Now, I'm going to give you a considered answer. The, the sun just came out over Jamboyang just then, and that, that to me was Caracal. We've got all the points of similarities between Joseph Rock and the book that we've talked about, the gold, the inaccessibility, things like that. But as an author, because I, I, you know, I write fiction things, you never base something based on just one place. You, you take from different sources. So I still do think that the Kudlunds is the, that acts as the actual location. But I think the underground detail, the, the clothing worn by the Tibetan porters and things like that, I think that, I think that is here. So that's literally, they, they moved thousand kilometers after the crash. Here. Yeah, but I mean, remember it's fiction. It's made up. I mean, it, it would be a historical novel if it wasn't. James Hilton has, has read and read and read about Tibet. He's picked up the, the idea of the Christian and Buddhist tolerance from Abbey Hook and some of the ideas of the, the Lamasseries in, in the northeast. He's, he's picked various things in location, which could be straight out of Joseph Rock. So the time and the space moved. Yeah, but that doesn't matter because, it, because it's a story. So he's synthesized, I think, all the, all the de various different things and he's put them together to make that magnificent novel. So Simon, either Kunlun or here, where do you think that's the Shangri-La? On points of contact, if you were saying to somebody, come to China, go to Shangri-La, here. Because this has got specific places, whereas the Kunlun's is an entire mountain range. Here, you can come and see the mountains, you can come and see the deep valleys, that's the thing, here. <laughs>